I'm pleased to introduce Leonard Mladenov today. He is a theoretical physicist who is good at making complex scientific topics interesting and easy to understand. He has made numerous contributions to various publications like the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, Scientific American, as well as a range of appearances on different TV shows. He is the author of many best-selling books, two were a collaboration with Stephen Hawking. He's here to talk to us today about his new book, Stephen Hawking, A Memoir of Friendship in Physics. Now I'd like to welcome Leonard Mladenov. Hey, David and everybody else. <laughs> hey, good, good to see you. Um, so, so we'll get right into this. Um, in, in his 20s, Stephen Hawking got diagnosed with ALS, and that resulted in the image that many people have, him, have of him in a wheelchair, speaking with a computer voice. And it, it seemed like a, a really debilitating thing. Do, do you think that he was upset by his disabilities? Well, certainly when he first was diagnosed, he was upset. He went through a period of, of depression before he was able to accept it. But uh, when I knew him many years later, uh, not, not at all. In fact, he, he considered it an advantage. I think it was his superpower. He had, he had grown so much through that disability and changed so much. And I think he felt that he made, had become a better person. Hmm. I can explain. Shall I, shall I elaborate a little bit? Maybe that's a little bit mysterious. Uh, I would say there's a few things. Um, one is that before he got sick, he was kind of aimless and um, had no passion for life. He did various different things, but it kind of, uh, you no, know, I call him a goof off because he was a pretty good student, but for him, that was a goof off. And when he got sick, you know how some people might find God in such a situation. And, and when he got sick, it, it, he didn't know he would live 50 years. He was told he would just live a couple of years. Um, he found he, he found meaning in life after that diagnosis. He he decided that what he wanted to do was use the rest of his life to investigate the uh, big meaning, the big questions of of life in the universe. Uh, where did it all come from? Why is it here? And 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 he found physics, and he really became dedicated in physics and found that he he loved physics. And he also told me that he found that later in life it really helped him focus. Uh, physics is a very difficult subject that you have to work on constantly and you're running into roadblocks and you're beating your head against the wall for months or years on end to tackle certain problems. And, and he found that because he couldn't do so many things, it really helped him focus on what he could do, uh, which was one of which was the physics and that that really made him a better physicist. And I guess I would add one other thing, which is that he, he, he was very adaptable. Uh, very flexible, and, and he, he was able to adapt to, to his illness. And in his physics, he did that by doing the mathematics a little differently than other people. Uh, you can do a lot of physics is, is, is either can either be done algebraically or with functions, you know, or, or geometrically, sort of with pictures. And it's kind of like the difference in high school between uh, algebra and geometry. And for those of you, since this is a Google talk, you probably know what analytic geometry is. So analytic geometry treats geometric issues with equations and uh, Euclidean uh, geometry uh, treats it with, with illustrations and, and shapes. And he found that since he couldn't write equations, which would just be a killer and uh, a fatal, mis fatal uh, flaw for me, I couldn't do any physics, but he could, he could work with these pictures in his head. So he took a geometric approach and that really, that, that new way of looking at things really helped him in his work. And so there were many ways in which I think he, he felt that his disability actually was an advantage. Hmm. Yeah, there, there are lots, lots to get into there. We'll, we'll talk about more of that in a little bit, but right now I'll jump back to, to his life before ELS a little bit. Um, it, it sounds like, well, let's, let's first talk about how he learned about Newtonian physics and how it applied to billiard balls. What lessons did he take from that? I think his big lesson was that Newton was an ass. <laughs> <laughs> um, he, he, he didn't care for, for Newtonian physics. I didn't either to tell you the truth. So I, I could identify with that. I think when you, when you take physics in high school and you're learning about billiard balls, it, it can be, less than exciting. I think uh, physics, uh, as you're taking your first physics courses, it really starts to get exciting when you go into quantum theory and the really weird aspects of modern physics, not, not the more, you know, the more ordinary. Newton's Newtonian physics describes the everyday world. And so if you're learning about billiard balls, you're not really learning anything new. You're, 
you're learning how to describe mathematically what if you play, if you play billiards, you, you, you know very well already. So it's not real uh, enlightening, but, but, but when you get to quantum theory and all the crazy things, particles, uh, you know, losing their identity or being in two places at once in a way and, you know, in a sense, and all these other things or curved space when you learn about general relativity, these are the things that excite your imagination. And so Stephen wasn't thrilled, you know, learning about the Newtonian physics. It also sounds like in college, he, he was a bit lonely at times. And part, part of what he did to, to deal with this was he became a coxswain. Um, can you tell me a little bit about that? Well, that, that's exactly right. He, when, I think a lot of kids, when they get to college, uh, are a little lonely. And, and Stephen, um, he had some problems in earlier years in school, kids making fun of him. He was kind of gangly. And um, I don't know, they, uh, they, they made fun of the way he looked or his sports uh abilities and when he got to college he found like many people do when they focus on their interest or they join a fraternity or if you join a sorority he joined uh he joined the crew and um and you know was very good at it uh and so he would just sit there barking out or you know i guess right left or whatever it is they say to the to the those who were rowing and uh, he was very you could really see there his adventurous spirit, almost reckless. I mean, his coach got mad because he kept getting into crashes and banging up the boat because he would try to do crazy things. But that's what you can see in his physics later. I think if you look at someone in their younger years, you can, you can, you can then later see the roots of the, or, or the, the uh, image, uh, the reflections of that in their older years. And he, his physics was kind of like that too. He, he didn't do conventional things. He was always adventurous and that's where he made his progress. That's fascinating. Yeah, I know at one point you said not only did the team not do well at times, it finished races with damaged oars and pieces of the boat knocked off. And <laughs> right. Well, if we um, let Stephen go, that's what happens, right? <laughs> he, he, he definitely didn't. Um, yeah, he was def definitely on the adventurous side. Um, and, and you talked about this a little bit. What, what aspects of this did you see later when you worked with him? Well, he, he, he was bold in his physics and he was bold in his writing. So if you look at the advances he made in physics, uh, he, his, one of his great strengths was to be unconventional and, and adventurous to take risks because, I mean, I don't want to go over all his advances in physics, but his most famous was um, the Hawking radiation. Uh, where he actually started out trying to prove that nothing like that could possibly exist. And, and, and he was quite adamant about that. And his mathematics led him to see that actually it's true. And he, he was surprised, but he was able to let, let go of his resistance to that because that's what the mathematics told him. And when, when he first announced it uh, to, a, to a meeting, uh, it was not met <laughs> with cheers and, uh, and uh, applause. It, people were um, somewhere between confused and some of them angry that he would say such, such a thing because it so violated their, their ideas. Um, of course, it became accepted, but but you know you have to have a certain amount of courage and and adventure in your spirit to 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 do that. And, and I should say that it was not just the result that 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 was um, uh, really groundbreaking. It was, it was what he did to to get that. He he took general relativity, which is what we call a classical theory. It is not a the kind of theory that's a quantum theory. And then he took quantum theory of electromagnetism. So that was a theory of uh, light and electrons and positrons and so forth. And, and, and that's a quantum theory and, and they contradict each other. And back then very few people were working on how you might reconcile that contradiction. But he took, he took both of them and used them together, which you have to do very carefully because they contradict each other. And normally that's not a problem because we use general relativity for large scale things, for stars and galaxies or the beginning of the universe. Uh, black holes we use them for t for today, you know, and we use quantum theory uh, generally for atoms. So they're two different realms, and physicists were able to get along with two different and contradictory theories, one for each realm. But he found that in, in a treating a black hole and under certain conditions, uh, you really need to use both, and that's where you have to be very adventurous and careful and, and take risks. And when you when you work on physics, almost nothing can be solved exactly. You're always making assumptions and approximations based on either mathematical intuition or physics intuition about the physical situation. 
So people can, you know, attack you and question what you're doing. And so he took two contradictory theories, made all sorts of approximations and assumptions to get some answer, then announced an answer as a very young guy, announced an answer that shocked everybody. And I thought that was a very adventurous thing, thing to do. And by the way, it wasn't obviously eventually accepted, but it's kind of interesting to me that the way it got accepted was people look at what he did and mm, semi accepted what he did eventually, but they a lot of them went and just re-derived it their own way. There's a number of papers repeating his conclusion that derived the same thing from different angles and everyone had their own kind of approximations and methods they would use. And that's how it finally became accepted. It, it sounds like... Um he could predict the the sort of reception he would get based on the way physicists behave in general when new theories are are announced. Can you talk about that at all? Or well, that that does often happen. Uh, some some new theories are met are relatively and quickly embraced. Uh, Einstein's special theory of relativity, for example, although there were some who never accepted it, it was it was pretty well embraced from the start. Uh, quantum theory was a whole story of the opposite happening at almost at every step people said this couldn't be true this is ridiculous you know max planck discovered a kind of a trick to explain something called black body radiation that was important around 1900 and in, in, in physicists minds and everyone could see that his theory worked for that but no one really thought it was a a theory that had any more importance or generality they thought it was some kind of trick that they would eventually understand just for this situation. It was Einstein who said, no, no, this is a principle of nature. We have to take it seriously. It's going to change everything. And he used it, the same principle, to explain something else called the photoelectric effect. Uh, that's what he got his Nobel Prize for eventually, not for relativity. But um, that people had a hard time accepting. Even Max Planck didn't accept that. And Max Planck later wrote, well, that was one of Einstein's greatest mistakes, but he's really smart anyway. This was, so Einstein did that in 1905, and Planck did that about 10 or about 10 years later. And everywhere along the way until the 19, mid 1920s, where we really, where physics really got to um, a theory, a quantum theory that you know was pretty well developed. People kept saying, no, th th that guy's doing or what he's doing is, is dumb, doesn't work. And, and they had a hard, very hard time accepting it. And it's very famous, of course, that Einstein in the end didn't even accept what he had wrought as people took the theory in other directions because the mathematics was leading them there and the physics was leading them there, Einstein himself turned against the theory. So it's often hard to get physicists to accept uh, a new theory. Uh, not always, but often it often is. And so when you come up with something new, you have to, you know, you have a certain amount of trepidation and a certain amount of excitement. Hmm. I'm, I'm gonna take a, a small tangent perhaps, but. but perhaps related to the way that Stephen saw things a little bit differently. What, what was his favorite passage in the grand design? Um, I some fish. I'm sorry. Sorry. sorry? I think you talked about a, a fish. Oh, his bowl. favorite, not Pat. Yeah, well, his favorite, I think one of, I wouldn't say his necessarily his favorite, but one of his favorite parts was the, what you want me to talk, tell the fish story? Because it's a, okay, Steve, so, so when Stephen, so, I went to Stephen after we wrote our first book together. He had read two of my books, Euclid's Window and Feynman's Rainbow. Um, and then he contacted me to write with him because he wanted to do a very, uh, well, I don't know if it's simple, but a very well-defined task. He, he wanted, he realized that, that his book, A Brief History of Time, had so, so many copies and that people weren't really understanding or even getting to the end. And he wanted, he was looking for someone to work, rewrite it with him in a, to make it more understandable. And he wanted someone whose writing he liked and who also knew physics. And then he read those books of mine. And, and one day I got a call and I said, sure. So that was a brief, briefer history of time. And so we did that and it went very smoothly. And it was, it was based on his original book. So it was fairly easy. But then I said to Stephen, uh, you know, let's, um, why don't we write a book on your latest work? Because Brief History of Time and Universe in a Nutshell, Briefer History of Time, all these books are based on his earlier work, but nothing based on what he was doing at the time, which I thought was very exciting. And so that became the, the grand design. It was about his ideas of the beginning of the universe in the, in the 2000s and some work that he had published. Um, but, but he didn't want to just do that. He said, I want to write a book that will present a new philosophy of physics. And that's where the fish come in. <laughs> so even though in the book we say, he says, philosophy is dead, and we had quite a debate over whether or not we should say that, 
Uh, his idea in the book was to present a new philosophy of physics. And that philosophy is something uh, we dubbed model dependent realism. And what that means is that, uh, so there's an argument in philosophy about how real physics is. There's the people call the realists and the people call the anti-realists. And the uh, realists say that there's an objective universe out there and physicists are faithfully observing it and um, transcribing, writing down a theory that describes that reality. The anti-realists, they say, no, no, no. All, all of the people are doing in their theories is organizing their, sensual, their sensory input. So a theory is more of a, a way of uh, structuring or organizing what you're learning uh, by about what your senses take in. But you don't take it more seriously than that. Uh, an alien or a bat or a goat or what, you know, another animal or a very intelligent animal from another planet would have a completely different um, brain structure and therefore a completely different uh, set of descriptions that has nothing to do with our physics and, and, and it would describe their sensory input and, and there's not necessarily any objective common reality behind that. So that's the two camps. And Stephen was kind of in between. He, he, he saw that in physics, we have different theories sometimes for the same thing that, that treat that, that situation using different concepts. So he said he believes in something called model dependent realism, which is that you shouldn't argue about <laughs> what's real or not real, but that you, you, you should take each theory as representing a certain reality. And it's okay if, if, you, if you have different views of the reality and they're all in a sense real. So that, that's the best I can do. It's not, not being a philosopher. That's how I would describe uh, the model dependent reality. And, and one thing that makes it really, I think, come to life is this fish story. So the fish story is, uh, it's about a, a fish, uh, a, a, a world of fish that live in a, in a curved bowl. And these are intelligent fish and they create theories about their world. And and because of the, the difference of the index of refraction between the air outside the bowl and then the glass of the bowl and then the water inside, uh, light rays that go into the bowl, they, they bend. And because the, the outside of the bowl is curved, this distorts the, the view the fish have of outside events. So these fish scientists would have some set of, of laws for what's inside the fish tank. But then like some of the ancients, they would have a heavenly realm where they would say outside, they would know it's a fish tank. but in, in the heavens and outside where we can get to, uh, the laws are different. And, and those laws would, would, would be different because uh, the we know standing outside that that's because the, the, the light is being curved as it enters the water. So they would have this very complicated description of, say, where Newton's, we, we say Newton's says that something uh, without any forces acting on it moves in a straight line. They, theirs would move in a certain curve because of this diffraction as the water uh, uh, refraction, because as the water, uh, the light rays come into the water. Fine, they would have that. That would work very well. And then someday, some new fish physicists could arise and, and say, wait a minute, uh, there's, this, there's this idea of, of refraction. And, and, and that person, that fish, could have reasoned it all out and said, no, outside, things just keep moving in a straight line just as they do inside. Uh, but the reason that it looks curved is that there's some medium that's outside that's different from the medium here, it's just like, say, the ether that people used to talk about. Uh, so our world has a certain medium, their world is another medium, and this fish scientist could, could say there's some boundary which has curves, and he, the fish, fish scientist could explain it all that way, just as someone on the, uh, a human on the outside would explain it. Okay, now look at it from the fish's point of view. They, they have these two theories which describe the same uh, perceptions that they have, but completely different realities. T to one, one theory says that that there's different laws outside the bowl. The other theory says the laws are the same, but there's this curvature that happens when light enters. And of course, that doesn't seem so shocking to us because we're humans on the outside looking at everything, but we're like God to the fish world. But to the fish who have no, can't get outside, don't know whether it's real or not, can't ever get there to see, and can't look down at the situation from the outside, there's really a quandary, which of these is real? And, and so Stephen would say, well, they're, they're both real. They're not, the one is not any more valid than the other. You use one in certain situations if it's easier or more or clarifies things better. You use the other's description when you want to use that. And you shouldn't you, you shouldn't uh, debate about there is a reality, but it, there's a multiple realities. And, and, and the different theories can be 
put together to apply to the same thing. And that the, the reason that that was important to him was his work really involved issues like that. Um, modern physics has a lot of theories that involve both observable things and non-observable things. It, it, it's a mistake to think that non-observable phenomena have no place in physics. You base your physics on observations and you test that your physics according to the observation, but the mathematical structure that you build might have other predictions that it makes that, that you can't observe. And if we believe, if, if the theory seems to work in the realm that we can observe, we tend to take seriously to some extent the, the, the predictions it makes about what we can't observe, at least when we're musing about the nature of the universe. And so there's a, it's really a, a, an important issue in physics today if you want to understand the, the philosophy of physics. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. Um, I, I found this interesting to, to hear about how your editing went in the book in that, that Hawking was, was Stephen Hawking was interested even in the small details, the wording of it and various things. What was the last um, edit on the book that y'all did? On it? Oh, my, well, okay. So again, forgive me to give you a little background. Uh, so <laughs> we had, when we started writing a book, we had a deadline and we, we, didn't make it. We had another deadline. We didn't make it. We just kept going past the deadlines because Stephen um, really focused on every word of the book. So uh, when I wrote a brief, briefer history of time with him, it was pretty easy going, and, uh, and it, it didn't take years. <laughs> but but in the grand design, I think because it was original, uh, he really we we really debated everything uh, the, the the outline, the structure, the not only the content, but the way we said it in each word and, you know, the pictures, <laughs> the illustrations. And, and um, so it was slow going. And eventually our publisher, I guess, lost patience and said, oh, it announced that the book didn't even tell us, just announced that the book was coming out with a certain date, which meant we had to be done by a certain date. And suddenly we had this another deadline, but this one seemed more serious because uh, it seemed like there'd be repercussions if, you know, the bookstores don't get the book when they were promised it. So we had this deadline. 8 p.m. on a out in in, uh, in uh, Cambridge time was 8 p.m. on a Friday night, and so that morning where I get there and I, I'm like going, oh my god, I, I don't see how we're going to get through all this. But if we, you know, if we really, yeah, we were near the end, it, and if we really put our minds to it, we could, I suppose, we could get there. And um, we're going, going, the clock's ticking, and every time I start. If I say, oh, Steve, it's, you know, it's five, he would just like either ignore me or roll his eyes. He didn't want to hear anything about it. And he's still talking about in, like individual words and stuff. And I'm going, you know, after four years of working on this, we have like three hours left. And, you know, and that didn't seem to matter. And then, you know, at some point I I had to step out for a minute. And, and um, I, I, I told his assistant, you know, you better extend my stay at the college and let's rebook my, my flights back. We're obviously going to blow this deadline. And, you know, and, and I'm like, Arr. and uh, it's now like two minutes back, two minutes to eight or something. I walk back in and we to continue talking. And now he's talking about one of the pictures, whether the illustration of a straw, a drinking straw, in one of the pictures uh, was, was realistic or, <laughs> or it was too long. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm, oh, you know, so I don't know. I don't remember what that picture looked like. And, you know, he doesn't have it in front of him, but, you know, he, I guess he just remembers everything. So I have to find the book, look up the picture. I'm, oh my God. Yeah, it is a little long. I mean, is that really, you know, I mean, it was a very serious illustration about string theory. So it's not like it was um, there for, you know, for its uh, artistic effect, but it was too, it did seem like too long. So I, you know, I, I write that down, and now it's like 8 o'clock, and I'm going, uh, okay, what's next? And then he says, it's 8 o'clock. We're done. <laughs> <laughs> We're done? You're just cut. You know, I mean, he said, then he said, like, uh, sometimes I need a deadline. <laughs> but if I had known that, I would have told them to ship the book, you know, two years earlier. <laughs> That's great. That's great. Soon yeah. we'll start to take some audience questions as we get them, but we'll go on for a few more questions and all. Um, what? What idea or creation was he proudest of? I'm sorry? What, what idea or creation was Stephen proudest of? Oh, it's interesting because Stephen is most famous for um, his, his work on the Hawking radiation, but it was an advance he made after that um, called the No Boundary Proposal that 
uh, he thought was his best contribution. And that had to do, so in, in, in um, Hawking radiation, what he did was he applied quantum theory to black holes for the first time, which people, or for, for basically for the first time, there may have been some other minor papers about it, but it was the first major application. And until then, people had, including Stephen, had treated black holes just using general relativity without trying to see if quantum theory implied any different uh, phenomena. And then his work in, it was, I think, 1981, uh, 83, um, on applying quantum theory now to the beginning of the universe, which also had been treated only classically using Einstein's equations. And that led to his work on uh, what's called a no boundary proposal. Um, and that, that was his favorite, uh, his thought, his best piece of work. Um, and that had to do with, uh, he realized uh, in that work that the Big Bang, which was his, P, you know, the, the, the famous part of his PhD thesis, it was a chapter four in his PhD thesis, was proving that Einstein's theory demanded this Big Bang under certain conditions, uh, that the Big Bang had to happen from a, that the universe, you know, is, is, it's smaller and smaller as you go back in time, and it eventually shrinks to just a point where, where the density is infinite, the temperature is infinite, and um, that's the Big Bang. If you go, if you play that backwards, it's the Big Bang. Well, he realized that, that, that quantum theory smooths that out in a way, so that doesn't really happen. And as you go back in time, what happens is time, uh, because of general relativity and the interplay with quantum theory, it starts to lose its, its character. It, it, you know, time seems to us to have a different nature than space, in our everyday life and our intuition. And as you go back and go back in time, though, it uh, it starts to change and look more like a dimension of space. And that smoothed everything out and, and really eliminated that singularity of the Big Bang. So that was his um, that was his no boundary proposal. It, it's not uh, it's not nearly as universally uh, it's not universally accepted as as his Hawking radiation is. But that was what he thought was his most important contribution. Would, would you say that he thought um, physics is life to him? <laughs> well, um, uh, he, he, he physics was a very uh, large part of his life, and uh, it was his passion. But he also had passion for people, and he 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 he, he found his relationships to be extremely important, and and was really a, a people person. He really valued being around people, and and you know, my son told me once. Uh, when he was in high school, basketball was life. And I said to Stephen, for you, physics is life. And, and he said, no, love is life. So I thought that was very, um, that was very touching and, and uh, some, uh, a statement that gave me a lot of insight into him. Yeah, it sounded sound like he loved people. He liked the attention that it, if they gave it to him. If, if you could choose one word to describe Stephen, you could choose multiple if you like, but if you could choose one word, what would it be? There's two. I'm, I guess you could say inspirational, because but then I'm not telling you how. <laughs> um, you could say I, I guess I would say optimistic, resilient, um, uh, brilliant. So I give you four. Uh, <laughs> there's a lot. I wrote a whole. That's why I wrote a whole book on it because I. It wasn't just one. One. There wasn't just one thing that I learned from him. There were so many, so many things, so many lessons. I. I uh, I mean, not only the, 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 the his life and all the I mean, in the book, I try to show you Stephen as a human, as opposed to what you saw in public appearances, where he was everything was orchestrated and sanitized and mythological, or in the movie, a lot of it was. In his everyday life, it was very difficult. Um, you know, if sweat was dripping down his brow, you, it tickles you and you want to wipe it off, but he couldn't do that. Either it would just have to take it or eventually his carer might see it and, and wipe it. But uh, that's just one example. You know, minute after minute, the way he was fed, he had to be fed going to the bathroom. You can imagine um, at night he can't move or turn. So you get these aches and pains and you can't do anything about it. He, he was he was constantly being challenged by, by his existence, he being challenged not to be tortured. A lot of these things that he endured would just torture any of us, and he learned that his that the, that his happiness and his his feeling about himself is, is really all up to him. It's in his head. It's kind of like the Stoic philosophy of the ancient Greeks, and he really was able to take command of that and and to rise above all that. And that gives you so many lessons. It, it teaches you, 
you know, to put your own problems in perspective. It teaches you that you can do the same thing and you can take charge of your own happiness. It teaches you what you can accomplish. You can't write equations down. That is what physicists do all day. And yet he was able to make accomplishments. He, I wrote in the book that he taught me that uh, a lot of us uh, are limited in, in what we accomplish only by the limitations that we give by what we imagine that we can do. That if you can think that you can do something bigger or better, that you can actually do it. And it's just your assumption that you can't that stops you. So there's, there's a lot of lessons there. Yeah, it makes sense. Um, when you're talking about the sweat going down his brow, you, you reminded me of, of a story that you told in the book where, where you tried to help him with, with this one time. Can you tell me about <laughs> Well, I did at the very beginning and I, his care had stepped out to the, to the bathroom and um, I was left alone with him for just a couple minutes which was not later on, that would be pretty common, but usually not done uh, that soon. And, you know, when I wasn't sure, didn't know him that well, but anyway, I saw a drop of sweat and I asked him if he wanted, would like me to wipe it. And he goes like this, which means yes, or he is, you know, he had a lot of facial expressions and amazing nonverbal communication. And so I, I, I went to, to do it. I dabbed a little bit and then I saw it a little bit more and I, started going back. I guess he could sense that my seat, that my hand was going a little fast. And then he started making some face, which I didn't quite get in time. But when I hit his seat, you know, his head just like rolled because he had no muscular control. So I kind of knocked his head over. <laughs> and, you know, I don't know. I, I can imagine that if you ever had a, a, a neck ache, I mean, that that I shudder just to think about how that feels because, you know, you're whatever, stretching the tendons. And, Anyway, was and he makes a face like that, which was not a good one. <laughs> and I'm like freaking out. What did I'm going to do? I think I, I, I just damaged Stephen Hawk. Oh my god! And I take his head and start to you know st stand it up straight, and then his glasses slid, and he had a sensor on his glasses, which was how he typed by twitching his cheek, and that sensor would sensor would pick it up. And now, but it had some alarm on it because it was outside of the standard of the distance it was supposed to be now so alarm is going off i'm moving his head around i'm going oh and i was just like new there i'm like, oh my god and then people come you know judith his assistant comes running in the carer comes running you know and it's like uh, anyway yeah that's okay. um, oh, thanks, for, thanks for asking <laughs> oh, yeah Let, let's take an audience question um we have one here maybe it'll get put up but it's what, what is your most memorable moment with steven yeah, I don't know if I can say a most. Um, I, I think that the book is is, is a series of um, those memorable moments. Some of them that I've mentioned already. I mean, the first introduction. Well, it wasn't really. I I had, I had worked with him at Caltech. I was on the faculty, and he would visit. So when we worked on um, a briefer history, but it wasn't as intense or as much because it wasn't. I could just write stuff, send it to him, and so forth. This was my first real engagement with him. So that was a big memorable moment. The, you know, the. Um, philosophy is dead i didn't you know we had a debate on that that was um you know the very end i mean the book really has that's what the book is it's memorable moment after memorable moment it's really there, there's some doozies in there it's a little hard to um it's hard to pick one they're all uh i mean it was i mean it was over many many years but 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 there's so many uh moving and interesting things happen yeah it sounds like this whole thing about philosophy is dead is played into his desire to have um, statements that have punch in them. Yeah, right. He, well, he, he had a flair for publicity, I think, and for uh, publicity doesn't sound, I don't want to say that it was, it's, it's not so much publicity as it is kind of um, like tweaking people or, you know, um, getting a response. Uh, not in a bad way, in a good, you know, but he was a, quite a character in terms of like, he, he liked to, you know, he, he liked to do, to do that to, to just uh, get a reaction from from you, so so I think that what you know when I you know I think he appreciated that part of that. He'd rather do that than than be safe. <laughs> it makes sense. And now we we have a a, a second part to that question. Um, what's what's the most important life lesson that you learned from Stephen Hawking, and is there any story behind that? Of course. Well, I think that's what I was uh, was talking about earlier. I, I learned the, the lessons of um, you know perspective in your own life. That you know, if you're getting, let's say, annoyed because uh, it's hot outside and your air conditioner broke, get over it. <laughs> you know uh, uh, that, that you're in control of your own happiness. So if you think uh, that you know 
if material things um, bring you happiness and then something happens and to one of them you can't get them or you're dependent on other people to be uh, for what you think of yourself you should work you know at least for me work on that take charge for, I mean I can be in charge of my own happiness that the lesson that I can accomplish things that you know my one of my bigger biggest limitations is just not thinking I can accomplish it you know and all, all these were, were lessons uh, big lessons yeah um if if you had reached beyond physics to to his whole life, what what do you think he might say that his the thing that he was proudest of in some way? Um, um well, I, I think his children. I think he 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 was very had a lot of love for his children. and was very proud of the children that he had, and they brought him a lot of joy. Sounds good. Let's let's um let's go to another question. We'll go with the this next one. Were there moments in which you disagreed with Stephen's theories, and how did that go? Well, we would uh, we would debate things. Now, so the theory that we were writing about was something called top-down cosmology, which was a sequel to that no-boundary proposal where you treat the universe in a quantum way, and um, and the conclusions that you draw from that many universes starting out and some, most of them recollapse, they have different laws, et cetera. That's what the whole book was about and the mean, what that means for the world. And um, I, I can't say I, as my, I mean, I would challenge him if I thought something didn't make sense to me, but I, I would, can't say that, uh, I mean, it would more, he would explain why it does make sense. And I would go, oh, okay. You know, I, I don't think I um, was able to punch any holes in his theory, but it was kind of interesting because the theory was being worked out at the time. So, at one point, I, I I was back at Caltech and I um, wrote a few pages about some aspect of the theory, and I even went up to Santa Barbara to Jim Hardo, who, uh, by the way, was the co-creator with Stephen of uh, the No Boundary Proposal back in the '80s, and was also working on top-down cosmology with him. And I went to see Jim because I didn't understand this, and and um, and I wasn't going back to Cambridge for a while, so I went and talked to Jim about it and Jim explained it. And I went back and I finished writing up that part, those pages. And then I get back to Cambridge a couple months later and what way we would work is, um, you know, when I was there, we would, I would go over his pages, which I had already read before I got there. He had, would go over mine, which he was supposed to have already read before I got there. And then we would, you know, go over word sentence by sentence and, um, and, uh, and then move on, maybe move forward a little bit, then decide what we're each going to do when we split up. And then we, I would go back home, and uh, so we would go back and forth like that. And so I took these pages. I'm back in Cambridge. I'm going over the passage that I read with him. And we get into a big argument because he's telling me that it's wrong, and I'm explaining to him why it's right. <laughs> and I'm, you know, I mean, not that I thought I could ever out – debate or you know i'll think steven but 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 i i was pretty sure of what i was saying because jim had explained it to me and we had spent a whole day on it so i'm thinking eh, you know and finally after like a couple hours of this and you know it goes slowly with steven because he can only express himself at six words a minute now that's okay for some things because i can see what he's writing and maybe finish the sentence or you can play 20 questions, yes and no. And there's, you know, he had a lot of nonverbal communications. For everyday life, things could get sped up a lot. But for very technical physics stuff, you, it was hard to speed that up. So we spent a few hours on it. And um, and then at the end, we, I, you know, I think he just realized, oh, yes. He said, that's what I told you last time you were here. But we realized it's wrong. And this is what we figured out is the new way of doing it. <laughs> and so in between when I had talked to Jim, they had changed their mind. Jim didn't tell me. Uh, Stephen didn't realize, I guess, for a while what, what what the problem was. And yeah, so oh well. <laughs> That's why I was sometimes pulling my hair out, right? <laughs> it's challenging at times, and it sounds like even though you were you possibly That's why I don't it. There, you see, I, this is okay. these are Stephen parts that I just pulled out. <laughs> Yeah, well, well, we'll go to this next question. Um, just curious, how emotional was Stephen, given that you mentioned he was a people person yet spent immense time in research? Uh, is that a, is there a scale from zero to? <laughs> uh, he, he he had, you know, 
the emotions you'd expect of any of a person. I mean, I'm not sure he was not a cold. He was a very warm person. A very he was a very feeling person. He I think he felt both his passions in love in in love and then with his family as strongly as his physics passions. Um, but I don't know really how to answer the. Uh, you mentioned one occasion um, in which you made sure to have a, an accessible bathroom in your house. Um, and the reasoning for that, why, why was this? Oh, well, of course, an accessible stairs to up to the house. So yeah. uh, well, because Stephen was in a wheelchair and um, he couldn't, you know, he couldn't get in otherwise. So the carers told me, well, we, you know, we can get a few, a few, a few of us who would either lift him up and then bring the wheelchair up. It's a very heavy wheelchair and it had a battery and there were, uh, a big battery in it and so forth, but but uh, computer, <laughs> but we could either bring him in the wheelchair separately, or we could take you know get enough to get four people maybe and take the whole thing up. But I, I I knew that he was very sensitive about disabled access. He was a very strong uh, advocate for disabled rights, and I I did I wanted to show him that I respected that. And of course, you know, not most homes are not unless you have someone disabled there are not wheelchair accessible, but I've managed to get a ramp built, have a ramp built that fit those stairs to get them up. And, um, and so I, I think he appreciated that. It, it was, it was very considerate. Um, in the book, you also mentioned a story that, that you felt it, it sounded like um, warned you against not having accessible when he went to a restaurant restaurant where they didn't have an accessible bathroom. Yeah, he did. He, he went to a restaurant. Uh, this was in the seventies and, and um, and uh, they kind of snidely told him, "No, we have no wheelchair accessible uh, toilet." He asked the carer. She didn't know exactly why at first, but she said, "I want to go this way, that way." He, he had her wheel him around to the back of the restaurant, and then he insisted on taking a pee there. <laughs> and, you know, he did that into a into a plastic bottle, and then he insisted that she dump it out into the bushes and the way and the. Um, Cook cup start runs out and starts screaming at them, and he starts screaming back because he could he could adjust the uh, the volume on his on his uh, uh, voice synthesizer, and he made it really loud. I just kept saying "disabled toilet, disabled toilet, disabled." Toilet. Yeah, and, and a year later they went back and they had one. <laughs> it, it seemed to work. It seemed to work. Yeah. So we'll, we'll jump back and get this question. Most of our questions have been tell us about Stephen because that's what your book is about, but. What would Stephen say if we were interviewing him about you? Oh, kind, brilliant guy. Uh, I love them. <laughs> uh, I I don't know. I, I, that's an interesting question. I don't know if I could answer that for anybody. Um, I I think he found me um, to be you know a good friend, someone that he could talk to and relate to, and uh, and I know that he enjoyed writing with me, or so I was told by other people who were around him who who didn't have to say that. It's not like I said, does Stephen enjoy writing about me? They would, you know, they would come up to me and go, oh, he so enjoys, you know, he's so happy to have you here and so forth. So uh, I think he I think he enjoyed our our relationship, our collaboration. Yeah. What what is I'm I'm picking up another question from the audience. What what is one thing Stephen is not known for, but you think he should be? Oh well, there's a physics thing, and and there there's a um, and there's you know I, I I guess there's one thing in the physics world that I'll just throw off, which 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 is not usually talked about because as much as his other that has to do with the event horizon. Uh, he made a very important step early in, in his career, and how you define that that's the, that's the border of a black hole. But I don't it's, that that would bore everybody to get into that, but. I think that 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 what he's not known for is the things that I'm talking about in the book. He, people, you know, you see him on TV and there's a question and he answers it. You don't realize what he has to go through to answer it. You know, he, uh, I didn't explain, I guess, how it works, but he has a sensor. Uh, earlier on, he has a sensor on his hand. He could, he could still move his thumb like that, but later he would twitch his cheek. The sensor would be on his glasses. And um, on his computer screen would be a, a list of letters rows of letters and the cursor would go from one to the next and he had to click at the just the right time to catch that row and then it would go from letter to letter in that row and he would click to catch the letter and after he had a letter or two it would suggest words so you could do another click to bring him to the list of words and he could pick word number seven or whatever it was a very tedious process that 
<clears throat> and, and you have to have tremendous patience because it, sometimes you want to click six and you click seven. Now you got the wrong word. Now you've got to go and find the erase button and the erase word button. And it's just very tedious. And it took about six. So six, he could do, he could do six words a minute. That's a minute's worth. That sentence is a minute's worth, right? So can you imagine the, the, the iron will, the uh, patience, the uh, kind of um, inner strength he had to sit there and do that. And that's not what you don't see that in, in you know, when you see him on TV, you know, it, it, because he's, had weeks to uh, to write the answers to these questions, and, and he just he has them there, and he just clicks answer, you know, answer one, answer two, and they come out all pre you know pre formulated. But I think the, um, the, the what it was like to be with him uh, as a what, what is every, what is everyday life was like, what his friendships were like, uh, his family, uh, how he did his physics, not not the physics that he did, but but what you know how he did it, how he related to the other faculty, and 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 his students, and all these things are things he's not known for because people, well, you know, biographers generally don't know because they're writing a biography, they they weren't there. Uh, the media doesn't want to talk about that because they want to talk about the issue at hand, whether it's his physics or some something he said about aliens. Uh, but I think that what, what he should really be known for is, is, is his life, how he lived it. Okay, um, our next question is, how would you tell a child what physics is about from your experiences as a physicist and working with Stephen? That's a great question. <clears throat> so I would say <clears throat> that physics is about um, understanding where all this came from. So <clears throat> you look around you, you, you have a house, a playground, uh, parents, you're, you, you have an earth, you look at the sky, what's that in the sky? What is that? What's that bright thing? What are those little dots at night? Um, physics is about all that. Like what, what are all these things around you? Why are they there? And why are you here? How did you, how did I, we get here? Um, where did it all come from? I, I think th those are, those are the questions that Stephen dedicated his life to, but I, you know, I wouldn't say physics is about, um, electrons or photons or uh you know transistors uh, building computers that uh that google can use <laughs> to uh can put software on or you know those are things that physicists do um and th those are things that are byproducts or outgrowth of what we learn when we ask the big questions but to me physics is about all those all those big questions and, and stephen's research was on that, and, I, and 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 a lot of my research is on those questions too. So, you know, in interacting with him, I it just I think I always felt that that's why I got into physics. But working with him really focused that for me because that was very explicit in, in his work and in talking to him that these were the questions that that he wanted to uncover. This this was the the gift that you had if you could do the mathematics and understand the physics. The gift was that you were able to to um, make a career. And make progress in answering these these questions that that I think kids uh, I think marvel about. I mean, when I was a kid, that I would lay there and go, "Wow!" I would think about those things. I remember hearing when I was I don't know twelve years old or something about curved space, and um, and that just so fascinated me. And, and you know, I had been learning about geometry and the one hundred eighty degrees of the triangles, and then and that you know they teach you that. Uh, it's like it's a doctrine when you get it in, in high school or and I think I was learning about it before that. Um, no one ever mentions that this isn't the way it has to be. This is the, you know, in high school, everything is just the way it is. Right. But it doesn't have to be that way. And, and when I learned that space could be curved and what, what does it mean to have a curved space? I was fascinated. And I found some old book on, on non called non-Euclidean geometry. I remember reading it in like seventh or eighth grade. And, and I was, oh, my God, it was like, you know, it was like science fiction for me. It was science, but it was fictional because no one told me this could be true, you know, and suddenly it's going, you know, it's better than science fiction because you're discovering stuff that's true and it's weird. It's just as weird as science fiction. So uh, and I think Stephen and I were like soulmates in that sense. And, and I think his colleagues, everyone who works in those fields, I think they feel the same way. Um, yeah, let, let me ask. Uh, I think this will probably be our last question and I'll 
I'll take our last question. <laughs> what, what, what did a talkative bartender in Cambridge who gave you a free beer have to do with Stephen Hawking? So um, there was a, a, okay, so with Stephen, because in the morning he it took a lot to get him up. Um, not, not, it takes a lot to get me up, but not for the same reasons. Um, <clears throat> he had to be bathed and uh you know dressed that wasn't all so easy his medical various medical things his vitamins feeding him so it took him quite a while and um and so he'd, he'd get into work around 12 usually and uh he'd look over the we call the archive in physics it's the um it's where people send their manuscripts and he did that almost every day he would see what the latest physics work was being done and so forth and Anyway, it took a lot till, till he was finally ready to go. He'd be ready to go, you know, maybe 12, one, maybe two on some days. And then we would work um, um, fairly late. Um, and so, um, oops, I'm just, I got so involved in that part. I blanked out the question. It's okay. I was asking you about a talkative bartender who told you actually about oh, yeah, black yeah, holes. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so, so um, when Stephen first got into this, um, no one, no one talked about, uh, no one talked about black holes. Uh, it, it was um, n not even physicists. It wasn't. Um, it, it wasn't really um, part of the mainstream. People thought you couldn't, uh, you never see a black hole, or you never see the beginning of the universe. And uh, so, so I, since I worked so late at night with Stephen which is what I was getting at. We would work pretty late and then we'd have dinner and get done around 10. Uh, I would, I would uh, sleep, you know, I was coming from California, so I would, I changed my hours and, and I would uh, go to bed around two or three. So I needed something to do at night. I would go to this, to this bar, which was supposed to close at 11, but they had this uh, funny way of doing things where they close their doors at 11. But if you got in before 11, you could just party on to whatever time. So, so I'd go into that bar at night and um, and have a few drinks, and um, this shows you how how physics has changed, how and, and largely due to Stephen, how black holes have changed so much. The study of black holes, back when he was doing it, nobody cared, not even physicists, right? Now the bartender is a black hole aficionado, and he starts quizzing me about black holes. He finds out I work with Stephen. He wants to know about black holes, but even more than that, he doesn't just want to know about black holes. He's a very talkative guy. And uh, as I start telling about black holes, he picks it up from there and he starts telling me about black holes. And he goes on and on and on about black holes. And I was mostly right. So I remember thinking like, what, what, a, what a weird uh, situation this is. And because of Stephen, that he took a field that even physicists thought was like, they thought it was boring, unrelated to anything, anything uh, that had no relevance for us. And he, not exactly single-handedly, but he was like one of the big leaders who took that nothing and made it to where you go into a bartender at midnight uh, for a drink, and the guy's an expert on it. So I thought, and of course, Cambridge is like that. That every you know, you'd be surprised. You sit down, and the people all around you are all like professor of uh, you know Af African economics or a you know string theorist. I mean, it's not some of the drinkers were like that, but to find that even the bartender was like that, and that black holes was what's his specialty. I just thought, well, you know, that's that's what Stephen did for the world. Okay, so the book is Stephen Hawking, a memoir of friendship in physics. I really enjoyed reading it. I liked hearing about his humanity as well as his brilliance, and I hope our viewers will too. Um, oh, could you hold it up so people could see? Oh it? yeah, sure. Here's the book. <laughs> yeah, so there's yeah. the book. Um, yeah, yeah. So thank you for talking to us about it today. Thank you. It's been fun.